Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this kind of panel discussion event around educating for the Anthropocene and um, I guess we're really fortunate to have brought together a whole variety of people actually from, from quite a diverse um, geographical spread um, and hopefully it's going to lead to some interesting discussion. So um, I guess Peter's book's been out a while now and um, one thing I wanted to point out is we've got Camille from the UK School Sustainability Network, um, who's going to be part of the discussion and sort of bringing more of a young person's voice. But um, the, the UK School Sustainability Network has been doing a really interesting role reviewing lots of books that have come out. And there's a, an interesting review that they did uh, recently around that. And I know Peter has also been participating in a whole series of events. And actually, Peter, you hosted an event at um, University of York on Friday. Hopefully, I know uh, Kay managed to, to, to get along. Hopefully some of that feeds into this discussion as well. So in terms of the way we're going to operate this and, and sort of run this, it's going to be relatively informal. So please, uh, whenever you think of a question, please feel free to put it into the chat and, and um, we'll find a moment to be able to, to respond to that. Um, in terms of a, a running order, what we're going to do is jump between each of the, the panellists. Um, they're going to have an opportunity just to introduce themselves a little bit and then also explore just a few moments, their response and reaction and bring forward their ideas. And then once we've gone through that, we'll sort of open it up to more of a, a wider discussion. I guess I'll just start also by introducing myself. So my name is Paul. I am the education lead for the Ministry of Eco-Education. And if you've not heard about us, we're a charity that's funded uh, by Dale Vince uh, through something called the, the Green Britain Foundation. And we're really we've got a, an, an ambition to help support schools to embed sustainability across their curriculum. So really wanting to to encourage teachers to shift in terms of what they teach, but also how they teach and help schools to be uh, more sustainable. And one thing we've done is pulled together a whole variety of resources that is available freely to schools. So. As part of that, there's an interesting journey that we've gone on with quite a few schools and we've visited lots of schools and it's been an opportunity to sort of see how the state of education, particularly environmental education and sustainability uh, is kind of across the country at the moment. So hopefully that we can bring to this as well. So I'm going to hand over to Peter, who's going to start us off. Thanks, Paul. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And thank you so much for uh, organizing, organizing this event. and. To everybody else for um for coming uh, really really appreciate it um there are lots of academic books you know that get written and that are just sort of gathering dust in, in libraries and i've been i've been trying to work quite hard to ensure that the ideas in, in this book which i think are quite um relevant to the the current sort of historical moments that we are living in and um, hopefully get discussed and, and that hopefully we, we have a chance to to reflect on those. So I just wanted to introduce the book uh, very, very briefly. And uh, in a moment, we'll, we'll play a little video that, that introduces the book. Uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to say a word or two about the title. So the word um, Anthropocene, I think many people uh, probably in this, in this event would have uh, come across already. Uh, it's basically this proposed new geological era, uh, which is characterized by uh, human influence, uh, the idea that humans have become uh, essentially primary movers 
uh, in shaping the natural environment and and altering the environment in in ways that uh, might be pretty much permanent, very, very difficult to to undo. Uh, the word has become quite popular in, in academia in, in recent years, um, but it's not without problems. Uh, it's it's a word that has also been criticized uh, by quite a lot of people because it, it tends to homogenize, uh, sort of put everybody in the same in the same category, assume that somehow everybody, you know, all, all people are equally uh, responsible and equally affected by environmental decay. Uh, which of course is is not true, and there have been a lot of uh, alternatives that have been that have been put forward. Um, but I thought for this for this project, you know, for kind of thinking about what the role of um, education might be at this at this juncture at at this time in in history, um, I think the word is quite fitting uh, because it is it is something that we all share that we all live in the Anthropocene, and uh, moving moving forward. Um, you know, it is something that we are going to continue to share. Um, and so I think the role of, of education in uh, preparing us, the young people, but also also the older people, I think, you know, education in the book is, is defined very broadly. It's not necessarily just just schools. Um, you know, the role of education is is really, really crucial. And that's that's what the book is um, is about. And um, I very much look forward to this conversation. Uh, I think I shouldn't say any more at this point. Maybe, Paul, if you can play the video, uh, that that will be a good good introduction to the book. We are living in the Anthropocene. But what does that mean? It means we are in an age of unspeakable violence against our planet. 66 million years ago, an asteroid collided with Earth. It caused the extinction of the dinosaurs and started a new era, the Paleocene. Today, humans have started another era, the Anthropocene. This time, we are the asteroid. Our disregard for nature has unleashed an environmental multicrisis, a nightmare combination of linked emergencies from climate change to mass extinction. My book, Educating for the Anthropocene, asks how education might help us prepare for life in this era. Answering this question led me to Pashulok in India and Wentworth in South Africa. Going to these places felt like stepping into a time machine, a glimpse of what the future might soon look like for the entire world. The huge dams and smokestacks around me made it clear that the face of the earth is now the face of man. But the young people in India and South Africa also showed me just how powerful environmental activism can be. Listening to young people and activists in Pashalak and Wentworth helped me see that to tackle environmental destruction, we must rethink education. They told me that progress starts with grasping what's at stake. This helps us care deeply about the future. Once we care, we can imagine something better. Holding this vision, we can communicate it to others. And when we come together in action, a better future can become a reality. Education has the power to transform the Anthropocene. But instead of obsessing over growing the economy, it must help young people grasp and confront the crises in our culture and politics that are behind the destruction of our planet. We must recognize activists as educators and teachers as activists. This shift is critical. The time to imagine a better future is now. Find out more by reading Educating for the Anthropocene. And I should just add very quickly that the book is available for free. Uh, I'm going to post the, the link to the free online version in the chat. So anybody who'd like to read it, um, you don't have to buy it. You can, of course, I won't say don't buy it, but you know, you can you can read it for free. Was there anything else you wanted to say at this point, Peter? Um... I think I think I've sort of taken up my five okay. minutes, so I think I'll better let other people. Okay, speak well, thank you so much. I mean, that animation that that um, you know was really uh, powerful in terms of communicating those key themes. So, thank you so much. I think we're going to pass over now to Camille. 
Hi, I'm Cami. I'm part of um, the UK School Sustainability Network, which is a group of educators empowering schools to take climate, empowering schools and students to take climate action. And I've been part of this since 2020. And I study biology, chemistry, and maths. And I'm particularly interested in natural sciences, plant sciences, and natural history. Um, and some things that I've done as part of UKSSN include making a video about the importance of group of green spaces that was shown in the green zone of COP26 and I've um, done a social media takeover with artwork that I've created um, to do with the environmental and nature crises um, and I was part of a, a summer trip to White and Woods to talk to researchers and um, so some thoughts about um, what educating for the Anthropocene means. So obviously um, it means giving students and teachers the tools they need to challenge the key like governmental values like infinite growth and um, as said in the book and imagine new futures um, and empower students to learn skills that they need for a fast changing future and then some other thoughts I had were um, that sometimes there's a I feel there's a disconnect between the curriculum and like student and teacher actions so um even though um, in the UK we're really lucky um like for example in geography to learn about climate change but um I just think of like geography trips that involve flying it just feels like there's a disconnect and we can work harder to engage more deeply with environmental issues and what they really mean and um, and I also think that um Although we're starting to see the impacts of climate change more widely in the UK, I think we still need to work on um, like teaching everyone to empathise with countries um, that are experiencing accelerated slow violence, like um, um, in South Africa and India, um, where the book looked at, um, in order to understand, like fully understand the impacts that the whole world will face. Um, and then I think that also general environmental knowledge, so that carbon literacy um, should be more taught and more widespread in primary schools um, so that everyone is aware of the meanings of different words and aware of impacts of climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna hold on to pull any strands out of anything and wait till everyone's had a chance to sort of share their ideas, but I think we'll come back and, and we can kind of pull on certain things that you've you've mentioned there. Okay, we're gonna pass over now to, um, uh, to Jonas. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> is this time for the slide or is- Yeah, so- uh, Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll okay, share. but- Hello from uh, from Copenhagen, Denmark, and thank you so much for the possibility to be here and and to comment on the on, on the book and uh, and some of the great thoughts. I I, I would just like to uh, add some perspectives also from from my line of work and my field that I uh, I also share with Peter, the field of environmental and sustainability education research, and some of the also reflecting some of uh, the Peter's work here. Uh, a lot of the stuff that, that I meet and that we find in education is very much trapped in what Peter points out as being old school uh, in, a, in a very linear way where we see things that we can measure, uh, very interested in modernistic technical fixes. We love that education as a societal tool, fixing stuff and the emphasis on, on what we can measure and so on. And I think you have a, a great critique there, Peter, also how that is uh, is found globally. And then often throughout the years, since the 80s, when uh, criticizing this position, we often move towards a circular position, perhaps a tap again. Um, and, and here we draw on, I mean, critical thinking and uh, in a continental perspective, in a Scandinavian perspective, we draw on Bildung uh, and uh, yeah, uh, enlightenment thoughts and so on. And uh, we developed uh, strands in, uh, in Denmark and in Scandinavia, emphasizing uh, action competence, for example, or critique of ideology is also very popular. So 
so these two positions often fight and and I see also that your project is is uh, part of this fight very much uh, in in the way that uh, that we need to rethink education in a new way move uh, beyond what we have but also include some of the of course resources that we face so uh, a question to everybody and to Peter is also how is this also corresponding with the duality of the Anthropocene because as you point out uh, Peter one thing is that we as a, a species has emerged as some some entity that uh, shaped uh, the globe as we know it but there's also another uh, thing that has happened in that we lost the the, the the illusion of control so modernity the last 150 200 years was very much marked by the idea that we could control nature control the planet but climate change covid 19 and other things show clearly that not only have we emerged as a species we also lost control so a lot of my work is in the in the third place uh, in the dunkel or dark i've uh, done a book called dark pedagogy not depressing dark, but uplifting uh, dark in a, or I guess also Scandinavian sense, trying to decenter the human perspectives, um, trying to open up for different realities. And I think very much you're doing that also, Peter, in your book, traveling the world and engaging with uh, very local and, and challenged contexts. Um, and then, of course, these huge shifts that we face and young people they uh, they face i mean the temporal uh, uh, challenges uh, suddenly we, we're very busy to change the world uh, very fast and also a loss of causality no longer can we decide everything the world corresponds we talk about tipping points where we lose control uh, and of course also the spatial unraveling that the challenges uh, challenges on the other side of the uh, of the globe uh, pushes uh, us uh, and, and our local communities to the brink of uh, existence. So I'm interested also in, in opening up the discussions of how do we uh, move between these positions Linear uh, understandings of education can do a lot. Of course, we should uh, uh, measure some kinds of education and gradually become better at it. And circular understandings are also wonderful. So it's not an either or here, but uh, uh, also a lot of new uh, academic traditions from post-colonial eco-feminism, post-humanist, uh, speculative realism, and so on, uh, are working on trying to establish new areas where it's not only the human perspective or it's not only the powerful perspective or the money's uh, perspectives that control where we're moving, uh, but in many ways opening up these questions. So I think I added some arrows, they are not uh, um, that important, but um, my question for us is how is the relationship between the good old linear and the progressive circular perspectives, but also what's new, what's challenging what goes beyond our vocabulary, our way of engaging with this. And of course, avoiding that, the very last tap, um, avoiding that everything slides from, uh, from uh, your work, Peter, slides from the progressive, from the new, from the interesting, and into a linear co-optation by often the national curriculum structures where there's very little space for us to move. So I'm, I'm interested in, in these different positions as emancipatory positions where we as teachers, we as uh, educators can do something new, but also trying to keep the discussion open so we do not only end up in a dogfight between the good old linear and circular positions. So that's some of my uh, uh, thoughts on where we are now and how the Anthropocene challenge uh, a lot of what we're doing as educators and researchers. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, any questions, uh, of course, uh, uh, later or on email would be more than welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So, okay, are we going to yeah thanks paul and do you want me to share sorry do you want me to yes. share? yeah please the... if you would that'd be lovely you have to give me two seconds do you want to introduce yourself and where you are of course yeah so i'm Kay sidebottom i'm a lecturer in education based at the university of sterling in scotland i'm really interested uh jonas was just talking about post-humanism that's kind of my background and, and the position that i tend to come from um and as we're about to reveal, um, I think very interested in the potential of art and art based practice as well to help with these kind of reimaginings and, and rethinkings of things. 
So yeah, I, I, I tend to always start with poetry. Um, and I think that point about art as being central um, feels quite key and it came through in the book as well. I just wanted to also thank Peter for the book and for the generosity in sharing it and making it open access. That was that was just a wonderful thing to do. So I'm gonna read the poem, it's called Infinitive and it's by um, Ursula Le Guin. So we make too much history. With or without us, there will be the silence and the rocks and the far shining. But what we need to be, is, oh, the small talk of swallows in the evening over dull water under willows. To be, we need to know the river holds the salmon and the ocean holds the whales as lightly as the body holds the soul in the present tense, in the present tense. And the reason why um, I'm sharing this, not just because it's beautiful, but I think one of the key questions that occurred to me as I read the book was really the, the problematic nature of schooling as it is now. And one of the things I keep returning to is how far is it possible for us to make change in education while we have a system that cuts against, that pushes back um, against the kind of change that we want to enact. So we're kind of caught, I think, very much um, in this dichotomy. Um, but I tend to also work with possibility, so I'm not gonna be really negative, but I do feel it's important to just talk for a moment about the context of what we're seeing, particularly um, in the English education system. And I guess I'm talking at a, mo at a moment where there's this very strong fetishization of order. And Peter talks about this as well um, in the book, whether that's about control of children's bodies via school uniform, via behavior management techniques, um, the restriction of movement. Um, the linear curriculum, even down to furniture design, there's a very strong um, thing about routine predictability um, and that linear curriculum that goes alongside that. And I think secondly, and more widely, we're seeing this just in the news this week, the shutting down of perspectives that don't fit with the state agenda. So for example, um, the assault on critical race theory, um, sex and relationships education is, is coming under the spotlight this week. Um, and also, of course, the view of the government that anti-capitalism is an extreme political stance um, and, of course, the removal of materials from, from groups, um, you know, not allowed to be using those in schools. So I think my sense, my immediate sense on reading the book was how on earth can we do this? And I think this is where it's so important for us to decouple education from schooling, because our, our thoughts and mine, of course, very often go straight to school when we're thinking about education and, of course, education is much wider than that, as, as Peter really importantly points out. So that removal of, a, of the equation of the education with schooling and starting to open up potential to think more widely about what it is and what it could be. So Peter's point that we need to turn perhaps to disorder is really interesting because I think that is how creativity, um, effective and attuned, and also importantly, bodily responses to things can emerge. So Peter talks about grasping, about caring, about communicating, and caring in particular, I think, calls us to bring our bodies back in um, to the debate, because you can't make change without feeling, without emoting, without empathising, um, as Camille mentioned. So those responses go way beyond our knowledge-based curricula, you know, that we see um, in schooling at the moment. So what can we do in order to decenter ourselves and, and, and feel those things in order to care and make change um, and, and be more activist. So my conclusion, I guess, was that there, there needs perhaps to be a two-pronged approach that both problematizes schooling as it is on the kind of macro level, um, but continues to work to change that from the inside. That might be through process of defamiliarization, making the everyday stuff that we assume and we see all the time feel strange um, because it is strange when you look back at it, but also micro actions, the day-to-day -day things that teachers can still do and work with within the system. And then of course, alongside that, the desire to see outside of the states, um, work more widely as educators, thinking about more informal systems of learning, rhizomatic, you know, using digital affordances, um, that again enable activism to work um, across the generations and I'll shut up now because I have loads more to say but that was my initial thoughts. Thank you so much Kay. Um, 
what I want to do maybe is give people a chance to respond to to what's been said in terms of the panel for anyone if there's any key key strands otherwise I've I've got some questions that can feed what we're doing and also Peter and I know Kay you were there as well I don't know if there's anything you wanted to share of key themes from from your Friday sort of event Peter is that something you wanted to share yeah, I mean, we had this uh, full day workshop at the uh, University of York uh, on Friday uh, with um, lots of different kinds of people, uh, academics, teachers, educators. And we were just sort of thinking together about um, what this uh, alternative approach to education might look like in practice. Um, I think everybody who was there would agree that, you know, it's it's a really difficult question. It's very difficult to translate some of these ideas that are in the book, which talk about sort of more of an ideal kind of world um, into something tangible within the current um, system that we all uh, are sort of moving within, uh, that there are lots and lots of constraints, uh, lots of limitations uh, to, to doing that. But I think at the same time, to me at least, what, what emerged uh, was, was this theme that this theme of agency within that system, right? That that even though we are, uh, you know, living in in some ways in quite oppressive systems, and that education is highly controlled, is highly bureaucratized, and that nevertheless we still have a degree of freedom within those structures, and that um, we can actually push the boundaries, and there are things that we can do which are meaningful and significant. Um, in the book, there is a there is a section called Outlier Teachers, uh, which is looking at this idea of the activist educator or the educational activist, and uh, sort of suggesting that maybe those those two categories are not really opposites, um, but that um, in some ways, you know, it's not mutually exclusive to be an activist and to be an educator. You can be both, and there are people who are both. So I think um, recognizing that and just you know thinking outside of the box, being being creative, not not getting sort of too depressed about the state of the system, but but rather uh, you know seeing seeing the system um, as a challenge, right? As a challenge to kind of think about you know what can we do within that framework. Um, to me, was something that that emerged quite quite powerfully out of the conversations um, that we had on Friday. I think that's a theme that we've found with this Ministry of Eco-Education project as well, is we've really tried to drive that sense that teachers have a lot of agency and autonomy within their own classrooms, that within their own four walls, as much as they might have very prescribed curriculums and there might be expectations at different times of the year, but the the, the sort of micro elements of lessons, the language they use, the images they, they incorporate into their teaching, they have uh, freedom and agency. I, I do appreciate there are some schools that are very prescriptive and have scripted lessons, but I don't think that's the, the you know, that really is the minority. The one thing I want to touch on as well, because I know from the teacher's perspective, this is something that can be quite sensitive, is that language of educators as activists and activists as educators. I don't know if anyone on the call wanted to, to talk to that point to make people feel more comfortable that actually um, there are different ways to define that sense of an activist. Um, particularly within this educational context. Anyone want to jump in from the panel? Yeah, go on, Jonas, yeah. Well, <clears throat> just going back to what Kay was saying, <clears throat> I mean, um, thinking about education as having also always a, a, a dual perspective in that it's it's bringing forward uh, the society as we have it, but it's also um, relating to a society, a world that's not yet there. And for me, that uh, instills uh, an, an eternal excess and surplus in education not necessarily in schooling, but in, in, in education. And that is something that when I talk with teachers here in Denmark, I, I work in, <clears throat> in Copenhagen, Denmark, and, and often it's very easy to relate to the, the educational practices in the classroom, where there's uh, possibilities for opening up. And of course, the, the school and the, the, the structures that surrounds us uh, can limit those. But, uh, but uh, being that education always relates to, a, to an open future, the, the, the kids, the young people, the adults that we have between our hands as educators, teachers, will move into a, a future that's yet not 
described and yet not uh, uh, closed. So I think th there is a great emancipatory potential in arguing that that we do uh, we never succeed in uh, in delivering. Um, I mean, uh, uh, perfect uh, applicants for yesterday's job market. I mean, that, that's often what education uh, wants us to, or schooling wants us to de deliver. But of course, our students, our, our pupils, they move out and they engage with a, with a future that's not yet written. So, so we see uh, now uh, 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 sustainability, climate change issues are mainstreaming in the, in the Danish uh, school system as well. And we, we see this as opportunities for opening up discussions that's already very close to most uh, teachers. I can see that there's some questions about the sustainable development goals in the chat, and we'll come back to that. And I was also just going to point to the fact that there's some really good examples of the projects that people are involved with um, that are real sort of uh, case studies and examples of this approach or alternative approaches. But just coming back to that point as well, could, maybe we can pull that together with that sense of uh, the economy driving schooling and jobs and that that's sort of linked to growth and Cami I know that you mentioned that do you feel that as a as a within the school system this that you're driven to always be conscious of needing to be educated for future employment um yeah I, I do think so to a certain extent um I feel like yeah in general it's always looking towards the end goal and like just thinking like the kind of focus on exams without really thinking about education for like general enjoyment and just curiosity so like in an environmental context like not like students and teachers like not wanting to teach or learn um things that are outside of the curriculum because they're not for exams when i think it should be more open and more kind of people should be encouraged to be more curious hey i know some of that sits with maybe your work yeah absolutely i mean i think you know gavin williamson said i think it was just um last year or the year before you know the purpose of education is to get a good job i mean you, you can't be more out there than that in terms of how that how you know the government views it and i think um Yes, there are still many ways that we can reimagine it. And I think the teachers have um, that wonderful opportunity, as you say, Paul, you know, Bell Hooks says that, you know, the classroom is always a space of possibility. So I do truly believe where agency resides um, is really important. People still have power. But I'm just going to say quickly one thing just on the activism point. And I think one thing we perhaps need to be a little bit careful of um, in talking about other forms of activism, which are, are really important. It's just to watch out for that softening of it that's that's coming at the same time as a policing bill that that's shutting down any form of dissent. And I think if we're not careful, um, it can go the same way as the word radical, which has become a really dirty word, you know, within the pre prevent agenda, when actually it's something very powerful about, you know, working from the roots and all of these things. So I think. Um, yes, let's think of many ways and different ways and creative ways, affirmative ways to, to be activist. But let's not also forget about the power of protest and, and, you know, seizing hold of that before we lose, you know, the ability to have it. So, yeah, I just wanted to make that point. I mean, yeah. And just linking on from that, um, like thinking about teachers as activists just made me think of yeah the language of the word activist and like how that brings up like extinction rebellion and i know in the past and um, when there have been protest teachers um i've seen teachers be very like much against those protests and like head teachers um not allowing students to go to them so um i think there is a kind of general um like thought around the word activist that it means you know it means radical and it means um like civil disobedience um but it doesn't have to and it can just be any form of action maybe uh there's lots of people on this call who might use words like imagination and um possibility and futures that maybe has a similar sort of connotation but is of a more neutral neutral term um peter should we jump on there was mention about the sustainable development goals and the idea that um, you know, obviously they're uh, globally agreed from the United Nations and seen as a sort of good framework to move towards a more sustainable future. But that's still a slightly problematic framework within education. 
Yes, no, it's it's a great question, and um, yeah, I'm really glad that that was that was brought up. So, so thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, the book is quite critical of uh, of the SDGs, um, but you know, the question in the chat was about whether we can still use them in teaching, right? So, rather than just kind of dismissing them, is there a way that we can constructively engage with them in in teaching? And I think the answer to that is is yes. Um, I think my criticism would be that oftentimes when they are discussed in the classroom they tend to be discussed uncritically. Uh, so they're sort of seen as this kind of unquestioned good, you know, the kind of final word on on the issue in a way. Um, and that's that's maybe something that that I, I find problematic because I think it sort of tends to shut down dialogue and uh, you know, really discourages the kind of radical imagination that 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 I'm calling for in the in the book. I think the way to to approach that, or one way to to approach that, and the way that I approach it in in, in my classes, um, is to to think about the contradictions uh, within within the SDGs. Um, so, for instance, there is a goal that talks about reduction of poverty. Uh, at the same time, there's a there's a goal that talks about um, economic growth. So, when you look at those two together, uh, it becomes quite obvious that there is a certain ideology that's operating here. Uh, which is basically suggesting that uh, we need to make more stuff to make people better off. So rather than having some kind of more equitable distribution, lowering the inequalities in the in the world, um, what we need to do is just keep producing, keep making, keep extracting, um, which you know then somehow is is portrayed as consistent with the more kind of environmentally oriented um, goals that have to do with with sustainability. Which then raises the question of what is it that we are really sustaining? Uh, are we prioritizing sustaining the economy over sustaining the planet, for example? Um, so I think the solution here is not to ignore the goals or to uh, sort of chuck them out of the window. I think the solution is to engage with them, is to point out these these contradictions and these inconsistencies and these these conflicts. Um, which, you know, to my mind is is a great opportunity for for some learning to to happen, right? Because it just helps us kind of demonstrate just how complex um, the the world is, and that in these uh, international forums like the like the UN, all of these agendas and and ideas and interests are clashing. Um, and maybe, you know, when we when we look at the kind of nice sort of colorful diagrams of the SDGs, these contradictions are sort of papered over because it all it all looks great. But when we start peeling peeling off the layers, uh, we realize that there are a lot of unresolved conflicts uh, underneath the surface. Um, and so, to my mind, you know, that is that is a really really good opportunity um, to to actually engage in some really critical critical thinking, in some radical imagination, uh, thinking about some role taking potentially. You know, uh, putting myself in the shoes of the person who believes in a certain agenda and how that agenda might clash with something else that somebody else believes. Um, so I think lots and lots of opportunities there. Um, but what I what I find troubling is is when they are taught as this this kind of unquestioned truth, right? The sort of bible of sustainability, as if there was nothing more to the sustainability debate than these SDGs. Um, so that would be something that I would I would personally like to like to discourage. But um, but anyway, that's just that's just my my take on it. Jonas, did you want to jump in? Was that thinking? yeah? No, I I agree with with you, Peter. That <clears throat> they're interesting. The SDGs they're interesting, and 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 a, a big problem for me is that okay, we can teach about them. I mean, they are they are perspectives on the global challenges that we face, but often they would be get split up, you know, and then you would focus on on specific uh, goals. But but for me, one of the the most important things about the SDGs is is uh, goal seventeen. I mean that that all of these different goals relate. So I think uh, I'm also highly critical of a lot of stuff uh, going on within the goals, and I know also uh, friends from from the global south have a very hard time working with these because. They're there's also heavy uh, post-colonial perspectives on these, but but talking about the, the interconnectedness between the different uh, goals uh, for me is uh, is a good way of opening up uh, the contradictions you're talking about, uh, Peter. In, in Denmark, we have a long tradition in the education and education for sustainable development, uh, working with the notions of the dilemma 
uh, as, as a central pedagogical and educational uh, aspect of working with sustainability. I mean, the, in the situation where you have to choose, uh, but you cannot choose between the different positions, uh, uh, growth or survival or whatever, all the different contradictions that we are put into. And, and for me, there's a, there's a, a great pedagogical and we would say didact uh, didactical um, space opening up in these uh, contradictions you're talking about in, in, in the way of uh, very interesting dilemmas that we cannot solve uh, and that we ex exactly have to work with. So, so the dilemma uh, aspect of it, uh, contradiction, and then uh, the, the interconnectedness, uh, which I think is actually something something new that we can say with sustainability that was harder to say before also with, with the former uh, Millennium Development Goals and so on. Thank you. So, so I, I think it's really interesting that we're having this discussion around sustainable development goals There's something that actually requires a fair bit of knowledge to be able to critically explore. And it comes up with Fran's question there, where she's saying, how do we um, develop any a gap in any knowledge in order to enable teachers to participate and engage in this? So has anyone kind of got stories or experience in terms of how we might be able to better um, provide confidence, I guess, because a lot of this, as much as it's around knowledge and skills, it's also providing people with that confidence yeah Jonas yeah yeah I mean for years for decades I guess people or teachers working with this were seen as uh, radicals as activists and the interesting thing is that now it's it's slowly moving towards a mainstreaming position where you can actually work with these issues without being a radical person at least now you're an activist and and what we see is that as always it's almost impossible to do uh, bottom up it's almost impossible to do alone so in denmark we have uh, quite strong developing networks across schools a different across different regions where where teachers they share knowledge but also where researchers policymakers teachers uh, meet share best practices promising practices bad practices which are also super important in order to develop this so for me, it's very much about uh, meeting up and uh, dealing with some of the challenges that, that you point towards, uh, Peter, because it's it's too hard. It's too hard. It's too much on our own to to deal with this. It, it's it's everything. I guess that's the the concept of uh, of a global sustainability crisis. So uh, so that's very hard to do without uh, heavy collegial support. That's a really important one, that mentioning of the networks. I, I was just going to uh, mention, you know, if there are networks that teachers can get involved with and that you're keen to amplify, you know, or good examples, I guess, there might be another one. Please just throw those in the in the chat. I mean, hey, did, is there anything anyone else wanted to throw on in terms of that teacher aspect? Okay. I'm just going to say something quickly about knowledge. And I mean, we talk a lot about um, about knowledge as being kind of core. Uh, it's obviously the the kind of backbone of the English education system, you know, and the knowledge curriculum and all of that kind of thing. And I think some of this language is quite problematic as well, because it's still about accumulation. Um, it's still about, you know, having something to evidence, something that you can regurgitate at the end of something. And it brings us back to these big questions, I suppose, of, you know, about what, what are we doing it for? Um, and I think th those points about criticality are, are definitely important, being able to be critical, but I think there's also something about maybe changing our ontology about what knowledge is. I know that sounds a bit deep, but, you know, thinking not just about knowledge as in of the brain, cognitively remembering and processing things, but also heart knowledge and um, what that means, what it means to, to know something in an embodied sense and all of those kind of questions. And I think those, those things are really difficult to unpick because they're obviously culturally determined. They might, you know, they mean changing a lot more than just how we educate you know um so I'm not saying they're big questions that can be answered but I think this thing about what what knowledge counts whose knowledge counts what is the knowledge for what we're going to do with it um I think those questions are really key it's been some interesting discussion recently around indigenous knowledges and and the weight and value of those and I think you know, particularly in the wider environmental movement there's an understanding that we need to reprioritize that and return to those and bringing more of that into the education system is going to be so important. I wanted to jump just to go to the word growth because it's it's come into this a little bit. There's there's been I, I think it got mentioned the concept of degrowth and the idea of anti-capitalism. And it's interesting in the English context that 
um, the, the government say teachers cannot kind of be anti-capitalist within the classroom. We can't be critical of the capitalist system. But on the other hand, there are teachers who are very comfortable exploring donut economics. And Kate Rayworth's book, you know, is ostensibly is anti-capitalist. Um, I wondered if anyone had anything to talk around that element of how we need to bring more of those ideas into the classroom and how we might be able to do that. Yeah, I have lots of ideas about that. I mean, you know, with this with this book, I, I don't explicitly frame it as as anti-capitalist. Um, partly because I think that, you know, the issue is is broader and, and there's there's more more going on. Um, but obviously, these these questions are, are uh, an important part of this entire conversation of how do we navigate the Anthropocene uh, moment? Um, some, some people might have seen Jason Hickel's book, uh, Less is More. Uh, where he makes this really interesting argument um, about the growth, but also really looking historically at what do we actually mean by capitalism? Uh, I think a lot of a lot of people assume that when we say critique of capitalism or anti-capitalist, that that somehow means that you know we have a, a kind of a totalitarian state that dictates everything, and and there are no free markets, and uh, you know people people don't have the freedom to to choose. Um, but what he points out, I think, very helpfully is that uh, markets have been have been around for millennia I and mean, people have been trading for a very, very long time. So so sort of free free trade or, you know, the ability to to freely choose what I buy, what I sell. That's not necessarily a feature of capitalism. And that's not necessarily what critics of capitalism are critiquing. Uh, it's, it's rather the kind of accumulation. The idea that um, you know that with capitalism, uh, you know you are uh, sort of pushed in a way to keep to keep accumulating, to keep accumulating wealth, to keep kind of um, you know having returns on your on your capital. So to, to use the capitalist language, um, which you know which then leads to to this need for infinite growth, which makes it impossible to have some kind of a stable state economy. Um, and I think that is a slightly different conversation from what a lot of people generally assume uh, we talk about when we talk about a critique of, of capitalism. Uh, you know, could we have a society in which uh, we are free to make choices about our consumption? Um, and yet um, we don't have this, this sort of um, push towards accumulation and towards um, further increasing inequalities. Uh, and I don't think that's necessarily impossible. And I and I think historically there are there are examples of of similar things in in history in different different societies and different cultures. Um, so I think in 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 some ways, you know, what we maybe need to do is to reframe the conversation a little bit so that it is less less threatening, and so that it is clear that we are not calling for some kind of an armed revolution and a total overhaul and overthrow of the current system. But that actually there are there are different there are different ways to to do this and you know different different ways in which we can um, we can kind of interpret this concept of of freedom, uh, economic freedom, economic choice, uh, and how that how that might function in a democratic society. Um, so obviously that's a, it's a sort of a slightly different topic you know which I don't go into uh, in the in the book, but but I do think it's a, it's a very important uh, a very important part of this conversation and. Um, something that maybe you know we we have some some work to do also as as academics in sort of demythologizing some of these some of these concepts and um maybe making them making them um making people understand that these are not as extreme as they might sound it's always interesting as well when you hear criticisms of the current system to say that actually the radical position is the status quo that the thing that's destroying the planet and and causing you know all of this harm is actually continuation of the current and and to to reframe and rebalance it like that maybe helps as well um does it yeah Jonas do you want to come in yeah <clears throat> just just to follow up on Peter I think also it's about I mean, again, not seeing it black and white, and she was saying it's not either capitalism or just living off the land on your own. Uh, I mean, uh, history tells us that that change is is constant, and uh, and we are in a in a period of rapid change, 
and, uh, and it's interesting now to see where the change is coming from. I mean, young people specifically are pushing the agenda in Denmark and to a growing degree also companies. Uh, our politicians are so slow to move with this. They are stuck, I don't know, 20 years back in time or something like that. So, <clears throat> so I actually, I, I, I have great hope also for this uh, continuous change also of our economic system it doesn't look good right now i know but but uh, i spent the the spring last year in the, in the, at stanford university at, at the in the silicon valley you know and and uh, and going there i would uh, see uh, uh, the richest society i ever witnessed that was in a total collapse i mean uh, homeless people all over the place it, it was it was horrible <laughs> to see the uh, the amount of riches that that didn't uh, solve basic uh, issues at the, at the same time um so so we need to also to talk about the, the contextualized problems. I think you do that in your book, Peter, by traveling around the world. What's the issues here and there? How are they linked to problems at the other side of the world? How does uh, trade and, and so on uh, play into to that figure? How can we think differently? But I actually see a lot of, of, of change also now, specifically from, from young people and the actors in society that are faster to react than are often slow moving politicians. And then, then for me, it's also interesting because in Denmark it's not radical for a teacher to be anti-capitalist. I think we are tinier, we've we've hidden, so it, it's not illegal. We can we can say that we can actually be uh, quite uh, critical of what goes on. But I think, as you say, Peter, that we need to be more nuanced also in what we are critiquing, not just uh, uh, labels and, uh, and and headlines, but also the specific mechanisms that are ruining our world. That, that international element, is that something to touch on as well? That sense that there's been quite a divergence, particularly within England compared to Wales and Scotland, and equally um, within the rest of Europe and, and globally, the education systems seem to be in a point where there's a, an element of extremity to it. Okay, have you seen any of this in Scotland yet? Have you experienced much of the Scottish system? No, not too much yet. I think um, it's interesting. Today I was teaching a class with international students looking at education. We had students from China, um, India, um, and we were talking about um, education models. And we, we did an exercise where we basically drew a classroom. We were thinking about um, the material and the kind of non-human teachers within the classroom. Um, and so we just had classrooms, but without any humans in them, we were comparing and, and thinking about what that showed us. Um, and interesting, I think, how similar everything is, <laughs> actually. And I think that's one of the things that isn't to say, of course, it's the same everywhere and things aren't uh, vastly different culturally and all of that kind of thing. But I think one of the things that, that we perhaps need to really think about is that idea of really being brave in imagining something different or even looking for difference. because. We, we just get so stuck in how things are, um, you know, making those intellectual and kind of imaginative leaps, I think can be really difficult, you know, because we're so rooted in it. Um, and I think that's possibly where art comes in. Um, I was gonna mention hallucinogenic drugs and I'm kind of joking, but I'm also kind of not because I think, you know, sometimes to actually take those leaps and make those reimaginings, you know, that there has to be some quite drastic actions because people just can't, can't ever see things being different from how they are. I think that's that's a real challenge. What about just to talk a bit more then about? I know we've said that there's education schools is part of this education sort of system, but the place of young people within their community through schools and education. Do you think there's a potential there for for that to play a role in in some? some change within society and how can education respond to that because I think we've seen examples of this where young people have protested within school environments for a whole variety of reasons or young people have called for certain changes teachers and, and educators have had to respond to that but do you think there's scope for that to play a role in in how society shifts and change I don't know Camille do you want to to talk to any of that Um, 
Can you just repeat the last bit of what you said? That role of young people within schools, I think because it's obviously a place where young people spend lots of their time, young people respond to society and think about it differently um, you know, for a whole variety of reasons. But is does that create something special that potentially could play a role in, in wider ripples? Um, yeah, I think that's kind of linking to um, Peter's idea of um, like students almost being objectified and not kind of listening to their views and they're kind of they've got a unique perspective where they don't have um like many like important commitments and etc so they can they can afford to think more radically so i think yeah definitely um making use of that and like letting letting them have more freedom and um, more opportunities for leadership um and then going outside of schooling, um, I really think with activism um, for students that um, like thinking about people like Greta Thunberg, not everyone is going to have that kind of courage to do something like that. But um, it would be great if if there could be some kind of framework that um, that it, so it could be more easy for students to get into activism. So like having I'm not really sure, but it's kind of guidelines or something so that it's easier for more people to be involved. I guess uh, through the UKSSN network, you've kind of had that opportunity where, you know, holding politicians to account. I mean, how has that kind of impacted you yourself? And, and you know, the kind of in terms of education, do you think that's had a beneficial um, impact? Yeah, I think that's really, really empowering, like seeing responses um, from people in like higher power and having having that opportunity is definitely and then working with other people who want to make that change as well is definitely very empowering and um, yeah Peter I don't know if you wanted to talk a bit more about where you have seen really good examples of education kind of facilitating that better future and, and kind of where young people have played a role in that well, so I mean, if I if I just focus on what the book is is talking about, and and that whole um, argument about activism, uh, really thinking about activism as a space of education, um, and I sort of go through quite a lot of examples in the in the book of how these um, grassroots environmental movements um, that I that I look at in in those two countries, how they uh, create ways for young people to uh, have their voice heard uh, to sort of uh, meaningfully engage with the debate about the future as political beings so not not as passive absorbers of knowledge but um but as as you know citizens uh who maybe are not yet of voting age but that doesn't doesn't mean anything right i mean that doesn't mean that they don't have ideas um that um can contribute to how the world is uh, how the future of the world is is shaped um, so, so in a way, the, 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 one of the points that I, I tried to make in the book is that um, if we sort of zoom out a little bit, as, as Kay was saying earlier, uh, and don't uh, just think of education as, as schooling, um, but we start recognizing that there are these alternative spaces, then suddenly there are all kinds of really wonderful examples and, and models um, that, that become possible. And, and those can be a source of inspiration for, for what we do in schools as, as well. Uh, so obviously my my bias is towards activism as, as somebody who's worked on that specifically, but that is not to say that that's the only space. Um, there are people who are working on environmentalism in the context of religion, for example, you know, and kind of religious and spiritual spaces and how they shape um, people's people's action and thinking about the future. So so I think just uh, again, thinking outside of the box a little bit and and looking looking at maybe examples that we wouldn't normally consider um i think can can be very helpful so i wanted to make sure there was an opportunity for anyone else in the audience to ask any questions so, so do put those in the chat and one of the other things i wanted to raise was this idea that was covid a missed opportunity in terms of opp providing a pause for education a shift a change it seems that uh, post the lockdowns and COVID, we have almost doubled down on our expectations and, and um, uh, what we, we want from education in terms of um, catch up 
And, you know, do, what, have you got any thoughts around that idea of could we have used COVID as an opportunity to actually try something different or to shift things? Or actually, you know, has there been some change? Have you seen any post COVID? Yeah, Jonas, do you want to start us off? Yeah, just <clears throat> it's been interesting in Denmark because there was lots of outdoor education uh, and some of those never returned indoors again. So so we actually have quite a few examples of, of classes just permanently going outside and just staying outside. So so it's it's, it's done a bit. And then I think it's it's a, a very powerful example of what the Anthropocene has on, in store for us and how we, we lose control and how we uh, we are constantly hit by what we cannot fathom and what we cannot incorporate into existing um i mean strategies or, or, or structures so so i think it's only only going to be more and more important how we deal with this and how we also exploit these uh, possibilities uh, that are often quite uh, horrific when they hit us but which of course will also change what we do yeah I think in the UK, we we experienced that through assessment and the way that the assessment framework was carried out. And it shone a light on how precarious uh, examination, external examination is. But we seem to have flipped back to just try and readjust to get back to the same system we were in before, um, when actually it was a chance to really talk about assessment. Does, did anyone else want to talk around that post-COVID idea? Just one quick point I would make is that I think one of the things that happened during COVID was that educational institutions started relying a lot more on technology. And I think that's really accelerated um, some of the pre-existing trends where uh, teachers are seen as sort of secondary, as kind of just, you know, uh, sort of policing students, making sure that the students are engaging with these online spaces that are created for them. And so I think, you know, we, we tend to think that idea that, that technology is somehow ideology free, but it isn't. I think that there are, you know, um, very kind of concrete um, types of, of learning and um, types of being in, in the world and interacting with the world that are encouraged through these uh, educational technologies, which, which have been really rolled out at, at a much greater scale during, during COVID. And, um, and and I think uh, maybe not enough reflection has has taken place on the kinds of things that are lost uh, when those those kinds of changes happen. Uh, I do get the sense that a number of uh, educational institutions have tried to undo some of that and to kind of go back to where things were, but perhaps not all. And uh, certainly in the context of of low income countries, um, where oftentimes um, you know educational educational policies are dictated by by donors and, and richer country, countries, I think, is, um, is is a particularly dangerous uh, sort of moment in, in that sense. Um, so I think it's it's something to, to to watch and and something to be quite reflective about and uh, perhaps resist to some degree. The, the interesting one for me was with the technology element is that we essentially had Microsoft and Google who were suddenly given um, space within the educational system. And no one was critical of any of this. Uh, you know, it was seen at the time as, as a real necessity, but it framed the language and the experience of young people. And, and I think that interface was was, was really dramatic. Uh, Pammy, you, you wanted to come in. Yeah, just thinking about, um, like going back to school post COVID, I think um, there was a very like strong sense of like, desire to go back to the old normal um of like before the pandemic um rather than and like going back to the familiar rather than like imag reimagining like a new future um so at the start there were changes like an example being not being able to travel so like um carbon emissions from like school trips being cut um but then everyone kind of generally wanted to go back to that so it all kind of went back to how it was before or even more um so i think that was interesting yeah yeah it was this um people have talked about it in the chat that sense of a deficit model and i think it's the same for those sorts of trips as well it was a sense that that's missing from the education experience we yeah. need to come back in regardless of the environmental impact or regardless of those wider elements um yeah 
I think maybe we'll keep going for a few more minutes. I know um, we've maybe run over what we intended. One of the things I wanted to ask Kay was your sense of the more than human. How can we bring the more than human into the educational system? And I know, uh, Jonas, I know this this fits a little bit with your work as well about uh, kind of positioning of, of, of humans and that recentering element. But Kay, did you want to? Yeah, I think um, it comes back to those conversations about indigenous epistemologies and also um, kind of reconnecting, I think, with some of our own histories, I'm thinking about here in the UK, some of our own kind of um, folkloric traditions and stories and a lot of the things that have kind of been lost, I think, in recent years. And I know you do a lot of work um, with this kind of stuff, Paul, it's, it's lovely. And I think in terms of, of kind of the more than human, that idea of decentering um, that Jonas talked about, decentering the human and not seeing our species as we are, of course, species. Um, being the only species that can actually teach or, you know, be learned from, um, I think is such a key thing. You know, if we start to think about mushrooms, for example, fungi and rhizomatics and what we've learned about that just over the last few years, um, there's so much that can be um, tapped into if we show a bit of humility, I think. And of course, if we if we start to see more than humans as, as teachers, then of course that again shifts how we how we view education, where we situate it, what we do with it, um, and how we respond to it as well. And I think that's where we come back to some really key responses around things like reciprocity and thinking about relationality very differently. Um, that there's so much I think that can be learned, so much that's that's valuable to to learn if we start to to view it in that way. But we have to at first take ourselves down off that pinnacle of the top of the species tree I think and it requires a lot of lot of humility. Jonas yeah. Yeah no this, this is super interesting because it's also something that we're seeing a lot of how, how do we deal with a world that's not only focusing on us and our needs in teaching in education and in one way it's quite easy I mean uh, uh, from the microbes in our gut to you know to the the environment that we can access to the to the the global uh, uh, planet that we live on I mean uh, it, it constantly uh, uh, infuses our everyday life with things that we cannot control. It could be just, uh, you know, meeting a chicken with uh, kids and seeing how they react to that. So, so the possibilities are endless and always there. But it's of course also very interesting how we develop uh, pedagogies and educational perspectives, thinking about learning. I mean, a lot of focus has been on effective emotional responses to the world, how do we uh, go into a forest and, and live there and stay there and just spend a few hours without uh, it being on, you know, if, if any good for us besides us just being there and learning from the world. So is that a way the, the effective emotional perspective? Should we have more knowledge about the planet? I mean, should we dissect the microbes and, and try to engage with them? Should we move through art? There's been wonderful uh, work done in, in Denmark, a, a, a great NGO called Called the sister society that worked with uh, sensuous learning. Good colleagues from uh, around the world working on this uh, wild pedagogies project where you actually go into the forest and you stay in the forest until it starts teaching you stuff. And, and it's very powerful. They have a meeting this summer in Norway, I think, uh, and also based in in, uh, in Canada and so on. So so I think one thing is that that the possibilities are, are endless for engaging in, uh, with the modern human and decentering uh, the, the human perspective. But our educational uh, pedagogical didactical strategies they are still in their infancy and, and something that we need to to uh, to model and, and develop together and that being said um, uh, most teachers know this perfectly well so so it's often for me just about talking with practitioners with teachers and and they have lots of ways of, of opening these questions up but of course you have to insist on that space you have to win it often from uh, from the things that seem set in stone but that's of course only for a tiny moment that's an interesting idea is sort of how much value do we set aside for those things when we're fixated on, on one thing but also that you're mentioning that kind of sense that to a certain extent some of this is 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 within all of us and it just needs unlocking or the opportunity to 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 come out and so 
and, and the role of, of that within that. Um, the, Alice has thrown an interesting um, uh, question, it, linking this to the idea of uh, burdening young people and eco-anxiety. And I wondered if anyone wanted to, to talk about that. Um, yeah, Cami. Um, so I think, first of all, um, like not addressing things um, would definitely have the like, sorry, um, could definitely increase the eco anxiety because um, like not taking action and like looking away from issues um, would just make everything worse. So I think definitely facing the facts and like facing the issues, but also not um, not taking on too much and um and like working slowly and working with other people um to to not have all the pressure on yourself but um but to learn from other people and and like look into these issues in a positive way and focus on what we can do and what's already been done um yeah that sounds really powerful yeah Jonas yeah I what I also wanted to acknowledge is we've overran and Peter had to actually jump off and go to another meeting so you know that uh, Peter's left the call but we'll keep going for a little bit longer one of the things I'm keen to um to also ask everyone and I'll give them a chance to, to think about that in a second as well is if there's one key strand for educating for the future what's that one key thing but I'm going to let sorry Jonas you jump in yeah no no just a quick comment on that I I have a project and a, a very good PhD student working on, on notions of uh, climate anxiety and eco anxiety among uh, children and young people. And what shows is that, that it's a very diverse concept and it's a very diverse practice. So first of all, I totally agree with you, Camille, that, that trying to uh, not talk about it is absolutely the worst strategy that we could uh, work towards. And then when we talk with children, with young people, it also seems that we are in many ways uh, uh, talking concept of eco anxiety climate anxiety is also it seems something that is projected from the adults onto the kids in the way that uh, when we talk about the kids uh, with the kids then it's then it's a whole range of different reactions some of them are are closer to anxiety some of them are closer to fear some are very progressive very productive emotions are uh, some are very you know uh, thoughtful and full of knowledge as you talk about okay but this idea that it's just a, a numbing experience of, of uh, existential anxiety. That seems to be our problem, the grown-ups problem, that we lose our world. And uh, that is now projected on onto children and young people. Uh, but if you ask them, then there's a whole range of different reactions. And some of them are very progressive, very productive and some others are not and should be taken care of and should be be uh, i mean uh, the, the emphasis of great care uh, a key concept as well so so it's very interesting but it's also much more diverse and also much more uh, uh, filled with potential than just the numbing of uh, of children i mean the, the children uh, young people are brilliant so of course they engage with this it's going to say on that as well i think it's it's difficult um for teachers, because, you know, if you're positioning yourself as the kind of font of all knowledge, you know, as I'm not saying every teacher does this, but that is kind of the model that we're used to, the teacher at the front of the room, the knowledge holder, um, you know, that that can make it very difficult in terms of what it puts onto children and young people in terms of their kind of own responsibilities, but also how hard it is then for, for teachers to then show the kind of humility the grace or the kind of uncertainty that, that allows those emotions to be kind of shared as well. Um, so I think that teacher positionality um, is, a, is a real issue with this. And that comes back, I guess, to Peter's point about the importance of kind of intergenerational work where people are learning from each other. I mean, as adults, why do we, you know, have the right to have grief differently or in different ways, really, or to position responsibility in different ways we shouldn't do? But I think the way that children are currently seen, particularly in the English education system, um, you know, very, in very much a patronised kind of manner um, and certainly not empowered very often. I'm being very generalistic here, but, you know, quite often that's the case. Um, 
yeah, then it just makes it very difficult to, to get past that kind of situation. And I think, um, yeah, more more humility, I think, is needed from, from adults um, across the board, really. Okay. Well, I, I think we'd, it would be great to explore that emotional element far more. I know that more and more people are leaving, so we're going to call it a day and say thank you so much. But what I would like to do is, Jonas, can I start with you? Just one last takeaway. You know, if, if you were to say something I'd really like to change or to happen more widespread? I think uh, handing back the power to the teachers is a, is a fast track to actually working with these challenges. Knowledge is, is hard to come by, but teachers uh, are extremely eager. So for me, uh, th that is a, a very effective and cheap way of doing wonderful eco and climate change uh, education, actually uh, empowering the teachers. Great. Well, thank you so much. Cami, do you want to share a thought? Um, I just really like um, the idea of moving away from this idea of human superiority in education. So in terms of like looking at indigenous knowledge um, and just in everything, so like looking to nature, but not nature as something like an object for humans to exploit, but as like the most important thing that we rely on um, and like incorporating that into like young like primary school education and then further on. Thank, Thank you. you yeah that's a really powerful yeah point hey absolutely agree with what Camille just said um absolutely that and I think the other point for me is is just about being more careful about separating education and schooling I think that that would be the, the key takeaway for me. What do you mean, okay, just in terms of? The, the way we talk about education, we, we automatically think of some systems or the kind of, you know, um, hegemonic system of schooling as we know it. And I think education, as it says in the book, could be so much more than that, has been and is in many places so much more than that in terms of being intergenerational or informal, community-based activist, all of that. There's many other ways of educa understanding education than seeing as a school, which is quite a problematic concept, I think. Yeah, that's a, another important thing to say. Thank you so much. Um, I hope that the discussion continues. I know we, this has been very compressed and, and sort of short, and I hope everyone continues to bump into each other and has the opportunity to, to talk about this more. So thank you so much and have a good rest of the evening. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.